Good evening, and welcome to Atlanta History Center's virtual author, author talk series. My name is Sheffield Hale, I'm president and CEO of the Atlanta History Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Atlanta virtually. Tonight, we'll be joined by author and musician Michelle Zahner to discuss her debut book, Crying in H Mart. She'll be in conversation with author Chanel Miller. If you haven't already done so, we highly encourage you to purchase a copy of Michelle's book from tonight's official bookseller and local independent bookstore, Acapella Books. A link to do that is in the chat. Michelle will also be taking your questions this evening. Please use the Q&A feature to submit those and she will get to as many as time allows. Now I'll briefly introduce tonight's guest. Michelle Zahner is a musician and author who performs under the name Japanese Breakfast. She has released two acclaimed albums, Psycho Pomp and Soft Sounds from Another Planet and her new album, Jubilee, will be released next month. Crying in H Mart, is her first book and it debuted in the number two spot on the New York Times bestseller list and has garnered widespread praise. She also publishes essays and publications including The New Yorker and Harper's Bazaar. She's in conversation tonight with writer and artist Chanel Miller. Chanel earned her BA in literature from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her critically acclaimed memoir, Know My Name, was a New York Times bestseller, a New York Times book review notable book, and a National Book Critics Circle Award winner as well as a best book of 2019 in Time, The Washington Post, The Chicago Tribune, NPR, and People, among others. She is a 2019 Time Next 100 honoree and a 2016 Glamour Woman of the Year honoree under her pseudonym, Emily Doe. We are so grateful that they are both joining the Atlanta History Center this evening. Michelle, I'll turn it over to you to kick off the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sheffield. Thank you for having me. I'm going to read uh, the beginning of chapter two, which is called Save Your Tears. My mother died on October 18th, 2014, the date I'm always forgetting. I don't know why exactly, if it's because I don't want to remember or if the actual date seems so unimportant in the grand scheme of what we endured. She was 56 years old. I was 25, an age my mom had assured me for years would be special. It was the same age my mother had been when she met my father, the year they got married, the year she left her home country, her mother, and two sisters and embarked on a pivotal chapter of her adult life. The year she began the family that would come to define her. For me, it was the year that things were supposed to fall into place. It was the year that her life ended and mine fell apart. Sometimes I feel guilty about misremembering when it happened. Every fall, I have to scroll through the photos I've taken of her gravestone to reconfirm the date and grave, half obscured by the multicolored bouquets I've left these past five years, or I resort to Googling the obituary I neglected to write so I can prepare to willfully feel something that never quite feels like the thing I'm supposed to be feeling. My father is obsessed with dates. Some sort of internal clock whirs without fail around every impending birthday, death day, anniversary, and holiday. His psyche intuitively darken darkens the week before, and soon enough, he'll inundate me with Facebook messages about how unfair it all is and how I'll never know what it's like to lose your best friend. Then he'll go back to riding his motorcycle around Phuket, where he retired a year after she died, filling the void with warm beaches and street vended seafood and young girls who can't spell the word problem. What I never seem to forget is what my mother ate. She was a woman of many usuals. Half a patty melt on rye with a side of steak fries to share at the Terrace Cafe after a day of shopping an unsweetened iced tea with half a packet of Splenda, which she would insist she'd never use on anything else. Minestrone she'd order steamy hot, not steaming hot, with extra broth from the Olive Garden. On special occasions, half a dozen oysters on the half shell with champagne mignonette and steamy hot French onion soup from Jake's in Portland. She was maybe the only person in the world who'd request steamy hot fries from a McDonald's drive through in earnest. Jampong, spicy seafood noodle soup with extra vegetables from Cafe Seoul, which she always called Seoul Cafe, transposing the syntax of her native tongue. She loved roasted chestnuts in the winter, though they gave her horrible gas. She liked salted peanuts with light beer. She drank two glasses of Chardonnay almost every day, but would get sick if she had a third. She ate spicy pickled peppers with pizza. At Mexican restaurants, she ordered finely chopped jalapenos on the side. She ordered dressings on the side. She hated cilantro, avocados, and bell peppers. She was allergic to celery. She rarely ate sweets, with the exception of the occasional pint of strawberry Haagen-Dazs 
a bag of tangerine jelly beans, one or two seized chocolate truffles around Christmas time, and a blueberry cheesecake on her birthday. She rarely snacked or took breakfast. She had a salty hand. I remember these things clearly because that was how my mother loved you, not through white lies and constant verbal affirmation, but in subtle observations of what brought you joy, pocketed away to make you feel comforted and cared for without even realizing it. She remembered if you liked your stews with extra broth, if you were sensitive to spice, if you hated tomatoes, if you didn't eat seafood, if you had a large appetite. She remembered which banchan side dish you emptied first so the next time you were over it'd be set with a heaping double portion, served alongside the various other preferences that made you, you. Thank you. So wonderful. I Thanks love the part about steamy hot. My mom, <laughs> instead of holy smokes, she'll say holy smoke. And I always imagine <laughs> magical steam <laughs> that's that's amazing that's yeah. so amazing my that's uh there's a part of my book where I think it's funny that a lot of Asian people they'll like whereas my dad maybe like an older white guy thing is um they'll always <laughs> add s's like every time there's like a restaurant in in Eugene called belly and my dad always calls it bellies <laughs> and yet like my mom who's Korean like uh, she, she called Bruno Mars, Bruno Mar. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. My mom, Beyonce was Beyonce. And I was like, <laughs> it's like, yeah. That's Beyonce. It's like a secret vocabulary. Only we know. Yeah. For the longest time, I didn't know that the Academy Awards, my mom used to call the Academy Awards, Academy Awards. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that like up until I was like 12 years old, that's what I thought that it was called. Like I thought that uh, it wasn't there. Was, I didn't realize it was an academy. I thought it was so, like someone's name or something. My book, I talk about my mom. She would say Jesus, Mary and Joseph. And I, I didn't know it was Jesus, Mary and Joseph. I was you like, it was Marion. Marion. Like, I think I also Jesus thought that. Middle name. It is then <laughs> because now two people think that it is. Like, you know Wait, so that's like Jesus's full name? Yes. Like his middle name is Marianne. Yes, on his driver's license. And his last name is Jesus. Right. <laughs> on his driver's On Jesus' driver's license. That's the next mural I think that you should paint is um, <laughs> Jesus' um, driver's license and, and full name Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure we could spend the full hour dissecting <laughs> from vocabulary. And I actually do have a very specific question about language later. But... Um, I want to say congratulations because I know you're at the Thank tail you. end of this yes. book tour, which is amazing. Your language is amazing. You describe in the book, like even cutting a cabbage, like the squeakiness and the waxiness. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what it's like to touch your knife to a cabbage. <laughs> you're just, your ability to document these like moments is so extraordinary and so visually rich. I, my first question about writing, and I know you majored in creative writing. Yeah. I and you took yeah. one nonfiction course in all I of took the zero class. nonfiction. Zero. Courses. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Okay. So I was a literature major. Yeah. With emphasis in creative writing, but I never thought about doing nonfiction. And like, it's funny. Well, why? why? What was your reason? I, I'd love to talk to you about this. Totally. Because, well, when I think about, I wrote a lot of fictional short stories. Me and too. when I <laughs> think about the stories I wrote, they were almost exclusively white characters. Like Me I too. remember this character about this story about a divorced, no, a white couple on the brink of divorce. who's like trying to decide who gets their cat named Mushi. Looking back, I was like, why am I, why? <laughs> Why you said you too. So why do you think it was for you? Um, I mean, because um, I thought that it was like, maybe like too easy or like, I, I think I just romanticized fiction, like in the sense that, um, well, I don't know. I mean, like, first of all, there were no care. I mean, it, 
you couldn't hide behind it, I guess. Like with fiction, it was like, you just assumed that characters were white because if they weren't white, then you'd need to explain why they weren't white, you know? And, and especially in, in um, when you're taking short fiction, which I feel like a lot of um, creative writing classes are because of the amount of time that you have, you know, it's a semester and, and it's not quite enough time to, to take on a novel probably. And uh, yeah, I mean, I remember taking short fiction courses. I think we wrote like three or four stories a semester. And you realize like if you're writing short fiction, you only have like eight to 15 pages to, to get the story down. And if your character is not white, then it feels like you have to dedicate four of those pages to explaining like, you know, why a character is not white or like what that has to do with the story. It can never just be a character who happens to not be white um, doing something that has nothing to do with their identity at all. And I wasn't really, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there was a part of me that looked down on, on stories about identity and I wanted to just write, you know, I was reading authors like Philip Roth and like uh, John Updike and Richard Ford. And, you know, there were these really gritty like working class kind of guys that wrote um, prose that like really cut to the heart and were, you know, these sort of like, um, just like ordinary observations, like with a magnifying glass taken to them to make them these like extraordinarily moving um, stories about just like relationships and people hurting each other. And that's what I was interested in doing. I was, I felt like in order to be taken seriously and, and literary, um, I had to write these sort of like gruffer pieces <laughs> of fiction. And um, I even remember I wrote a short story for my thesis called Rosebud Salve. And it was very much about um, visiting my aunt Unmi in Korea, who I write about in the book, um, when she was sick with colon cancer. And I changed her name from Unmi to Aunt Emmy. And instead of eating whatever like Korean dish that we were probably eating, we ate chicken and broccoli. <laughs> Because I was like, oh, we there. And then they shared chicken and broccoli out of Tupperware containers because that's, <laughs> that's what Caucasian people eat together. <laughs> um, but, you know, the story was the same, but I did, I felt like if I, if I had introduced her, I would have to, like, describe, you know, like, Korea or describe, you know, and, and instead I think I described, like, you know, just, like, every town USA or something and, like, the streets have, um, you know, the names of fruit trees and stuff like that and I just felt like that's what I had to do but I, I yeah, I mean, I, I was a creative writing major mm -hmm. and I, I mostly wanted to be a creative writing major because I just loved the kind of material we were reading and I loved, and I really didn't want to write an English thesis. <laughs> I was like, I know, like, this is, like, not going to work well for me. But I had this wonderful professor named Daniel Torde, and I took every single class that he had to offer except wow. for his nonfiction course, because I just was like, wow. I'm never going to use that. I have no interest in writing about my identity. I, I You know, I don't want to, I think I, part of me, like, looked down, like, writing a memoir, writing nonfiction still feels, like, less cool to me than to say, like, my novel, you know what I mean? Or, like, uh, to be able to wield fiction, I, I feel like, in a way, um, which is unfair. And maybe it's just one of those, like, grass is greener situations where, like, if I had wrote, written a novel, I might, like, want to write a memoir or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, even, like, geographically, I remember I did take Asian American lit, but you had to bike over to this little building. So it's always oh sort of like in a corner. <laughs> Other, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. you can go there if you want, but it's not yeah. going to be embedded <laughs> in the curriculum. Yeah, like what a perfect metaphor, to, yeah. to go tell your story. Um, but that being said, we're both biracial and both wrote memoirs in our mid twenties, which is the most like unlikely thing, yeah, ever anticipated. Um. So in your book, there's this moment where you, are, you, your mom and dad are eating corn and your dad like <laughs> takes the, the corn husks and is just like tossing them over the railing in your yard. And he's like, they're biodegradable. And your mom is like sighing and you're picking up <laughs> on that because she doesn't want to see those like ratty husks like on her lawn. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. so slowly. And I, a memory like that, it's not like you were like, it's not a formative memory. It's not a memory where you're like, dear diary, my dad, like discarded the corn husks today. So my question is, <laughs> how, <laughs> like how, what was your process of 
memory extraction and how did you go about like finding these everyday memories? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question. And like one of my favorite parts about having written a book is that everyone just like picks up on different things, you know, <laughs> like no one has talked to me about the corn thing since, <laughs> since I've, you know, I've okay. done like, this is like my 14th like virtual book tour or something and like a uh, date on the virtual book tour and no, no one has asked me about the corn. So thank you so much for, <laughs> for bringing that up. That's just, I think one of my favorite memories. I mean, a lot of it was like trying to figure out what made up my dad and certain things that endeared me to my dad, because a lot of his character was like really fraught. And, you know, I, there was so much of anger. I think it, uh, I had towards him that I, I realized that I had to work through and get and let go of in order to be fair to him in this way that was really important to me. Um, writing K was also like that it was just, you know, it's not interesting to me to make a villain out of anyone. And I don't think it's realistic or fair. Um, yeah, or just, or how life is. And <clears throat> so it was really important to me to try to like present them as like fully rounded characters and, and at least give the reader the chance to understand why they might have done some of the things that they do in the book and, and what led them to make certain decisions that they did. And in that process, it was really wonderful because I, I feel like I was able to really understand who they were and, and where they were coming from so much better. And I was able to move on in this way and, and, and kind of find uh, forgiveness in that. Um, and also examine myself and, and, and where I like sort of failed and, and um, where I fell short in, in certain, on certain occasions. But um, yeah, that was just like, a, you know, it was, I, I, I did not spend as much time with my father as I did with my mother growing up just by nature of him being the breadwinner of our household. And um, so it was fun to come up with memories that I have of him that just really endeared me to my father. One of those things was, uh, you know, him collecting the like Tim, like uh, kindling from the the property to like ignite these bonfires um, in our backyard and and uh, cutting up the blackberry bramble and and yeah just another thing of like you know it, it was something he did all the time to, was like throw these corn husks and it drove him <laughs> crazy and every time it was always like I think it's partially because he worked with produce like he was a truck broker mm -hmm. for like produce distributors um, but that was just I think. I think I, that memory always stuck with me because it was how I probably learned the word biodegradable, you know? <laughs> like, um, and so I remember like him always doing that. And, and um, you know, I mean, it, it used to be a chapter title and it, and it should have been a chapter title. Really? Um, but, that word. Yeah, it was. It was, wow. I forget what chapter it was for, but it, the, the chapter of, uh, was, was once it's biodegradable. And I felt like it was such a perfect, metaphor for like how um it was sort of about how like daughters return to their mothers in a way because you know it's almost like this thing that has to like um like get rotten and then it like regenerates something you know and and I feel like so much of my teenagers with with my mother was this really rotten time where we really like our relationship really decayed in this grotesque way and then returning to her and and, and getting to have this really um, fruitful relationship after going through that um, was like this, you know, regenerative thing. Uh, but instead, it's just kind of like a throwaway line that I think colors um, just a memory of a, of a happier time with my family. You know, I can, I can, I, every time I read that passage, I, I do, I can just see him doing that. And it's also become kind of like a running joke with our band because my dad is such a low, gruff voice. <laughs> Um, and, and he's such a weird, intense guy, uh, the, the guys in the guys in my band have come to, to meet on a few occasions. And so every time we like throw an apple core on the ground or something, it'll be like, it's biodegradable. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's stuff like that just like sticks with you. And I, and I think that it's like, you know, if you like, I mean, that, that's like the real, when you find something like that, like, and, and you just, call, it's so fun to pepper the, the book it with things like that. Cause that's what makes thing, you know, things really special is like stuff like that when, that you hold on to. Totally. I, I might, I think my dad is here, but in, when there was a really <laughs> bad drought in California, he would like flush and not pee. No, he would pee and not flush to save water. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Put buckets under all my mom would be trying to wash dishes after cooking and he would save all of that murky water like 
for the plants or wash his. Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah. My mom was always like, just dump the bucket of <laughs> dirty water. Like it's the, those things. <laughs> but dad, yeah. hiding climate change. I'm like, I would never think to document that detail, but now I'm publicly yeah. announcing it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a technical question, which is, I realized that our moms would talk about themselves in the third person. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That and was, I that's didn't so didn't realize great, yeah. until writing, because then when I was writing quotes, my mom would say to me and she would refer to herself as mommy. I was like, is that going to yeah. confuse the reader? And your mom yeah. would say like, mommy is the only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The truth. And I, yeah. like, my theory is that like, your- Because of your the mom, language. Oh, you think me? the language- I wonder if it like, because of like the way that you translate, um, cause I'm trying to think like- Oh, this is um, what I had. Yeah, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't speak Korean fluently, but um, I wonder if there's something in like the translation that that that, that 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 makes them do that. Or I know that also, you know, like I talk about this in the book, but Korean moms were all, when I went to Korean school, um, you know, I never knew anyone's name. I don't know my I grandmother's know. name. Oh my God. <laughs> I have so much guilt. I've definitely asked my aunt before and I've like forgotten, but I, my grandma was always how many and like my mom always referred to her to like as how many and I have this guilt, but I never, I still don't, I don't know my grandfather's name or my grandmother's name because I always called so them funny. that. That's so funny. Yeah. My papa, I was like, First, I realized another Chinese kid. I was like, your grandma's name is Puo Puo too. And I also thought her name was Poo Poo when I was little. It was like Poo Poo. Yeah, yeah. And then it evolved to Puo Puo. And then my boyfriend asked one time what her name was. And I was like, I I, I could not tell you to say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes me feel a lot better. better to ask. Yeah. yeah. I still don't know it <laughs> right now. I don't either. I've asked my aunt and I and I forget her yeah. real name. Um, That's so that funny. is funny. But I that that really stuck with me because I remember when I was a teenager being at the mall mm-hmm. and my mom, you know, I like bumped into someone that I knew, you know, and you're like trying to play, you are <laughs> like bumping into someone at the mall. You're like really trying to play it cool. It's a really intense moment, you know, at that age, I, I feel see. like, <laughs> you're, yeah, you're like, you're, you're seeing like someone that you wouldn't usually hang out with. It's like, you know, someone popular, you got to play it cool and you're with your mom and you're like, mom, go over there, you know? And so like, I remember seeing someone from my class and, and her being like, Mommy's just gonna go to that store. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So whenever you're done, like go to, you know, go to J. Crew or whatever. And I remember being so mortified. So I was just like, don't, <laughs> don't call yourself mommy in front of like Claire Christensen. Like, <laughs> because it was like so infantilizing, like for her to not only say like mommy, but like <laughs> to refer to herself in this third person. Like I, cause I never called my mom mommy since mommy, I was like five no. years old or something but she always yeah. referred to herself as mommy totally. um but I remember just being so mortified and that being a thing that that she did all the time that's funny that your mom does that too totally I so my theory was that like they they had separate lives in separate countries prior to us existing so they mm-hmm. had like a self and then they come here and create a self and I feel like when my mom talks to me as when she's like mommy cut a peach for you it's like this that self cut a peach for me uh, but, uh, you know what I mean it's like way mommy more poetic. Self cut yeah. a peach rather yeah, yeah, than yeah, yeah. not like I cut a peach my mom doesn't want to cut a peach for you but mommy will cut a peach you know that's beautiful like, like that's like a really step- poetic lovely way to think about that that I never yeah. that I never considered it's just interesting or it could just be something gets lost in the language but it yeah. is it is really interesting um I was gonna oh I was gonna ask selfishly I want to know like I love this little moment where you go to Korea and you get complimented on your double eyelid and you didn't know that that was a thing to take pride like why would we ever take pride in a flap of skin but I have no idea yeah yeah and you're like I'm beautiful (laughs) (laughs) I also like never knew it was also revealed to me that like my both of my aunts had had plastic surgery and I had no idea they both had the cut and actually my mom for how like kind of vain she was actually never 
mm. was the only sister that didn't have any work done. She was like all about it. And I remember her uh, saying that she, you know, when she hit a certain age, she was going to get like a facelift, which like is like kind of an antiquated thing now. I feel like she would just be getting Botox like everyone else. Right. But I remember being like, <gasps> like, oh <my> God. God. <laughs> like <Wow. laughs> and now I'm kind of like, should I? Like, Can I? <laughs> For my birthday. <laughs> That's so funny. But so what what features of yourself did you really despise when you were younger? Things you didn't mm. like yourself or your appearance versus what you love about yourself now? Because I think often the things we like hated are now like our favorite things, or at least for me. I would say that I still hate the things. <laughs> Um, I hate, but you know, they're not from my mom. They're from my dad. And so I, I like, yeah, I, I wish so badly. I was like, God, like, it sucks that I inherited anything from my dad. But, um, <laughs> but also the things that I, this is like too graphic to share, but like, I, uh, I hate the, this isn't like <laughs> maybe where you wanted it to go, but just like, I hated like, you know, my black hair and now I, I mm -hmm. love it. Um, I hated like, I think that <laughs> the space between my nose and my mouth is too long. Too long? <laughs> it's too long. And uh, I, uh, and I, and I have very small lips mm. and, you know, oh, yeah, so I, I, I really, I really, yeah, you know, like my, my white lips I, uh, <laughs> and my like tiny upper lip. Uh, and I, I definitely fantasized about getting um, injections, but it's, it's too <laughs> Too Should I just go sure. get injections and Botox. After. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I got from this conversation was that, uh, yeah, we're gonna go meet up uh, in the city and and go get Botox injections. But yeah, all the things that I inherited, I have horrible teeth, and when I was a kid, I used to like hold my um, my one of my teeth kind of crosses over the other, and I used to sleep trying to like pull it to the other side like that works and That's uh so sad <laughs> and now it is sad and now it's you know I've just accepted that uh it is how it is but yeah. um you know like it's funny I mean yeah I don't I don't know what I, I can learn from it. What, what were your things my nose probably is like too flat your nose seems so inoffensive to me yeah, well, I don't know right what nose. I was saying, but I wanted like a cuter nose. And then when I did, I did this photo shoot in China and they put pieces of tape on my eyes so that I would have a thicker double eyelid. I was like, come on. Like, oh I, my God. I, Wait, like after the book came out? Or no, no, no. Was this was like before. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, 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 not for the book. <laughs> have you, where's your mom from? Uh, like super Southern China. A few hours you, in Vietnam. Do you, do you travel? Have you been there? Or? Yeah. And I, it's funny, I, I really resonated with your mom calling you a chicken shit because that's basically what I was every time I, <laughs> there. like, I remember, I relate so much to just, okay, well, one, just complaining a lot, right? And mm -hmm. something about, they, there's not as tampons, like tampons aren't common there and when I mm. got there and realized that and it was summertime I threw a fit and my mom's oh, like yeah, how yeah. dare you <laughs> get so angry for not having one thing and I was like how yeah yeah I think this is a luxury like this is yeah 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 there's so many that kind of friction yeah um, yeah I really identified with and then what was I gonna say oh and then I loved there's a scene where you're in Korea with your mom and all of her sisters and kind of on the outside of language right and I've yeah. felt that way before too and so you play waitress like your job is to make sure everyone's being fed and the snacks are refilled and I think a lot about how maybe being in these situations made you can attribute attribute qualities of being like observant or like mm -hmm. with other people because of all the times you were forced to spend like not being able to enter the language but yeah like, yeah yeah to engage do you feel Definitely. that way at all? that it 
Yeah, I do feel that way. I feel like it also, you know, I was really surprised to learn um, that some people are very uh, afraid of traveling to countries where they don't speak the language. Um, mm. That was just never, like, I remember talking to my brother-in-law about like how he was nervous, you know, he thought about visiting his cousin in Japan, but it made him very nervous to not um, know the language and, and like not be able to wield that and get around and stuff. And it just never even occurred to me that that would be something to be worried about, you know, because I, I spent my whole life getting to travel. I was basically like, I was practically born on an airplane. And so I had this incredible privilege of getting to fly across the world every other summer and experience something that was so simultaneously like a second home, but also so foreign um, that it was never a fear of mine to, to travel to other places where I, I didn't speak the language. And I think part of it was like, well, I can't even communicate with like my grandmother. And so it, it didn't, you know, but you can get so far with like, um, you know, like learning how to communicate with each other in, in a certain way. And, and so I always felt like, you know, I sort of fearless when it came to going to other countries where I couldn't speak the language because I was really used to like what that was like to not be able to um, completely understand what's going on. I feel like as I got older, I have more of an anxiety about that now than, than when I was younger. But um, so much of that I think is like, just a more complicated feelings that have, you know, for instance, like I never was, ner uh, I guess like, cause you're just more worried about how people perceive you. And I wasn't really worried about that when I was younger. And now, like, for instance, when I go to Korea, like I, I hardly ever wear, this is like so raunchy of a chat, but um, I, I never wear like a bra usually. And, and I don't even think about it. It doesn't bother me here. But when I go to Korea, it's like, Oh, I should really wear one. <laughs> yeah. I feel like really like it's like extremely inappropriate for you to like do this, and and I feel like no one's ever said anything to me, but it's just like the panopticon of like Korean like um you know uh, approval is, is 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 so overwhelming that that it it really impacts me. Um, but yeah, I, I, that kind of thing that you know I remember too when I was like a in. I was like 12 or 13 or something. And I would wear, I wore like a little midriff bearing shirt. And my, my aunt was like, you know, I was talking, I think I was like bitching to my aunt about like how strict my mom was. And she was like, well, she does a lot of things that I, I would never let you do. And I was, <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, you're so cool. What are you talking about? You're like the cool aunt. And she was like, well, I never let you wear like you know, in Korea, they like don't like showing your belly button, especially back then was like a big no, no. And, uh, and my mom always used to say, it's like, because that's like where you're, you're connected to your mom, you know, that was like wow. you know, your the source of like where you're connected to your mom. Um, cause I remember like most teenagers, like from our generation, like was just dying to get my belly button pierced. And that was like <laughs> the most insulting thing I could have ever said to my mother. Uh, but yeah, I was Stabbing like- your connection. Yeah, exactly. You want to set for you want to pierce <laughs> like last remaining physical like marking. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like, uh, yeah, I think it definitely made me courageous in some ways though. I, I find myself really uh, hating not knowing, knowing the language. Me too, for sure. But it's, we're still young, so we got We're time. still young, it's still possible. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, so in your book, <laughs> there's this scene, you're playing your first gig at like a pizza place and your parents <laughs> are there <laughs> and you're like on a metal fold out chair and <laughs> yeah. you tucked, like flared jeans into California. Oh yeah, like the, oh yeah, that was a big sort one. Sort of like deflated, like strumming on like a cold chair. It, it's so amazing to, to watch your trajectory. And then, then you go to when you're 25 and your mom has just passed away and you're, you're working at a pizza shop and living on your parents' property and go into the shed on their property to write Psychopomp. And then that gets picked up by a label. And I heard you say in another interview that they were going to hire a PR person for you and that your response was like, it's your money to waste type of, thing. <laughs> <laughs> but there's like such a, you were just not aware of like the power you held yet. And that's really being revealed right now. And I, I would love to just hear you talk about how the things you are doing now and like even the life you have now mm -hmm. was at some point so felt so impossible and so unimaginable and I would love to hear 
you talk about how your ambition has changed and like what you thought was possible then versus what you think is possible for you now. And if you have any limitations like at all anymore as to what you can become. That is such a good question, Chanel. Thank you. <laughs> so thoughtful. Um, I think that a really good lesson that I, I love to share is that, you know, um, it, it doesn't, a lot of the times it's not that your work is bad or not ready. It just hasn't reached the right hands, you know, and the place that I was in when I wrote Psychopomp, you know, I had been playing in bands since I was 16 years old. So I had been like really paying what I felt like were my dues for nine years. And that meant, you know, I was making, I had made a number of records. I had, um, you know, done a lot of shows where, you know, it was pay to play, like work a restaurant, go on tour for three weeks, get fired, find a new job, go on tour for another three weeks, get fired, find a new job. And, you know, sleeping on floors with like cat shit, like strewn all over the place, <laughs> like, breaking out in hives because those are so <laughs> disgusting, like not taking a shower um, at someone's apartment because it looks cleaner to not even shower in there. And, um, I was just, it was, it's a tough lifestyle, you know? Um, and like, there were many a time that I played in a basement where there were like 10 kids, like passing around a coffee can with like, you know, people tossing in cigarettes and cans of soup. And it's just like, what am I, it got to the point where it's just like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I didn't write Psychopomp and think it was any more brilliant than anything else I had ever done. You know, like every record that I made, I thought was like, this is the one, this is, mm. you know, my best work. It's brilliant. I like, am sp I am special. Um, <laughs> I had believed that for a really long time. And then when I hit 25, I, I was just like, if it hasn't happened to you yet, like um, it's not going to happen, <laughs> you know, like it's time to let it go. And especially in the music industry to be 25 and like not have found uh, a fan base for yourself, but you're just an ancient, you know? And so it just felt like I needed order and like regimen after my mom passed away and it maybe subconsciously I felt um this is what she would have wanted would, for me to like close the book on this and, and and try something else out um so psychopomp was just kind of like you have this like let it go and just like write it like find a small label to to put it out sell 500 copies over the course of the next like 10 years be like David Berman from the Sil Silver Jews and like go on tour like once every five years to your like cult fan base and, and keep this regular nine to five job. And I was also always convinced that if I worked a nine to five job, I would climb the corporate ladder really quickly if I, if I wasn't so focused on my like stupid art or whatever. Um, but then, you know, that was, that was, I was very wrong about that. <laughs> I did not do a very good job. I was, I was so miserable. And I, I remember, you know, also during that time, I wrote this little essay for Glamour magazine and I had submitted it to all these places, similar to Psychopomp. Psychopomp got sent to all these labels, like small, small labels. My friends' labels didn't even want to put out my records. <laughs> like, I really felt like, like, I remember like sending it to like double, double whammy and like um, being like, you know, oh, they'll definitely um, like put this out. And, and even they were like, I'm really sorry, Michelle. Like, I don't think that this is going to do very well for us. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it would just took a long time. And I remember, um, yeah, Yellow K Records were like, worth, and I told them, I was like, I'm not going to tour because I've done that before. And it's like, it's not going to work out. And I have a job with health insurance now I have to hold on to. And of course, that was like the fucking record that, that blew up, you know? And like, I didn't even, when we did the press release, I didn't even say that this was a record about my, like there was no narrative about like, this is a record about her mom passing and, but it just came out because I'm like such an open book and I did all these interviews and and um, that quickly, that narrative kind of came out and I think really resonated with a lot of people. Um, and yeah, I mean, at this point, I'm so far from even like my wildest, dreams like when I was a teenager I never thought I would have thought even even at 16 with like no knowledge of the world at all I was like I I'm, I never thought I might be in a bus like a tour bus you know like that was ridiculous I would have been totally happy being in like a in a van 
maybe getting one hotel room, like a holiday in for like four band members to stay in. And now we're looking at a tour in, in the fall and we're going to be on a bus. And like, I have like maybe a crew of like nine people. And like, I never, ever thought that we would get there. I never even wanted to, because it just seems like, you know, and now right now it's just kind of like a sick curiosity of like, well, how far can we go? You know what I mean? I'm going to just try my best <laughs> and work as hard as possible, but it's like, I have no idea what's next, you know? And it, I think that that's just ambition in general, where you're just like, I don't even know what to want for anymore. You know, which is like amazing. I have nothing, I don't aspire for anything. Yeah, yeah. Which is an unreal. I mean, like, obviously like, you're just like running for the next thing. And I just feel like I'm always just trying my best and whatever happens at this point is like, great, you know? But like, if, 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 it, if it all goes to shit for some reason, like, and we go back to like, touring in a van with four people in a holiday inn. Love that for me too, you know, like, <laughs> would've, would've, would be totally happy. But at this point, I'm just like, I don't even know what to aspire to. I'm like totally happy with, with everything we've built and, and less than that even. But it is interesting because I remember when we first went on tour um, with Mitski, it was the first like real yeah. tour I had gone on. And we played at Music Hall of Williamsburg, a sold out show, and she had her name on the marquee and it was like Japanese breakfast and JSON underneath it. And I had this very specific thought, which was if I can get to where Mitski is right now in her career, I'm done. Like I can retire and, and be totally happy. And then a year later, we did that same exact tour routing and we sold out Music Hall of Williamsburg and our name was on the marquee. And it's almost instantaneous, you're like, Okay, what's oh, that? No. You know what I mean? Like, you're <laughs> just, <laughs> like I, it's because like, just, font. <laughs> yeah, just like ambition just like gets yeah. you there, you know what I mean? And, and something about that is exhausting and something about that is really beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so it's both. Like there, there's a part of me that's just like, I'm happy right here. I'm happy like t five steps below this. Um, but then it's also just like, you know, I think your natural ambition is just like, how do I push further? Maybe it's an Asian Keep thing. Keep expanding. <laughs> Great. Um, so we're going to shift over to some audience questions. And Michelle asks, what was the hardest part of your book to write? And what was the easiest? And I want to add to that, like, for me, my favorite part about writing was that grief, which is so, it's like so much bigger than you, the feeling itself. But then by your like third draft, it turns into like a puzzle. Like yeah, it becomes yeah. a language puzzle and it yeah. becomes so much more about craft. And that for me is the really enjoyable part. So I actually, I'd also love to hear about you tackling one of your favorite passages and like what you did to make a certain moment work. I love that question. Um, the hardest part to, the hardest chapter to write in its entirety was living and dying, which was, uh, it's in the middle section. It's, it's, probably our, our darkest moments. Um, we take a trip to Korea with the hope that, you know, this will be a, a, like a beautiful, fun goodbye vacation where my mom can visit her family and her home country. We can go to Jeju Island and sit on a beach and, you know, relax and enjoy each other. But instead she gets horribly sick. She goes into septic shock. Uh, we're in this hospital in Seoul for three weeks and it looks like she's going to die there. Um, and the doctor comes in and says, you know, it's likely by the end of tonight, she'll be put on a ventilator and you have to decide with one another how long you're going to keep her on that ventilator. Um, so that was the hardest chapter to write. Did you read your audiobook? Read your audiobook? Yeah. That yeah. Was, yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. It was three days. It was actually like a lot, I thought it was gonna be way more tedious and grueling than it was. It was actually like, for me, it was really therapeutic because I had taken months away from the book and I could kind of come back to it with like this newfound appreciation and read it, you know, like, why would you read your book, you know, so intensively, like for three days, like again, you know, unless you had to do it. Um, for me, I was really worried that I was gonna cry a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I only cried one time and it was and it was during that chapter because it was just so hard to remember like how dark those specific days were and like watching my mother's health deteriorate like so rapidly and lose like <clears throat> a lot of her dignity, I think, or, or at least she felt that way. Um, the hardest, <clears throat> the most interesting, so because that was so hard, I think it was hard for me to figure out how to dive so deeply into like the almost like grotesque nature of, of illness. Um, and also like 
have some breathing room to like make it re- like that pacing realistic because the, it what you know and it was difficult for me to remember too because I had blocked out a lot of that experience that I didn't want to go there you know for a long time um and and the hardest thing for me to figure out was um you know my dad and I left the room and we went to a bar to kind of like talk talk it out and when we came back she was suddenly fine and I needed to expand this time that my dad and I were outside of that room to make the pacing feel believable that when we returned it wasn't just like and then we left and we came back and she was fine you know like it it really needed to get stretched out but it was like I couldn't really remember what we did besides like we went to a bar for drinks and I remember sitting outside and so then, you know, you, you, yeah, you get crafty and you're like, okay, well, what was the weather like? What was this, what season was it like? And I was like, okay, well, it was like probably um, September, early September. So it's like humid in Korea, but the weather's maybe changing. And what were you wearing? I was wearing this like summer dress and I was just living in this like cheap summer dress with this hospital flip-flops. So then from hospital flip-flops, it was like, okay, I was probably like clapping one of those you know heels like against my foot to like and so then you start like picking apart the conversation and like adding these like little gestures based on like you know asking yourself these questions like what are you wearing what is the weather like where are you sitting what are you drinking Mm -hmm. is there anyone there with you and then finding ways for those things to do multiple things at once like I, I remember you know my dad was like um he like probably looked out at the the city, but it's like more than he's looking out at the city. He's like looking for it as if it's going to answer some kind of question, you know? And so then you like infuse this gesture and this moment with like an interior feeling and, and almost like a, like, like psychological, like motive for like what he's about to say. Or like, I remember, you know, he was, we were sitting at a picnic bench and there was no one out there. And there was probably a knot in the wood. And I do have this memory of him kind of like trying to wipe it away. And it's in that moment that it's like, it begins to feel like, well, he's not just wiping away a crack in the wood. It's like, he's trying to wipe away what's like on our table right now. You know what I mean? Like with this situation of like my mom's health and and this like uh, horrible situation we've gone in, it's almost like he's trying to wipe that off. So that to me is like the most exciting thing about craft is like figuring out those puzzles and what to do there. And I remember having like a real kind of aha moments like this epiphany that oh this is what writing is like this is how you put together a book then I feel like you know when people ask me like if I ever think about writing another one it's because of figuring out puzzles like this that make me want to like be like well now I know how to how to go in on stuff like that and that was a th- that was something that I don't think I learned until like the third the third revision you know right and that was when the real like kind of magic happened yeah totally past the processing you know what's funny about writing now though like for me it was it was so like physically excruciating like it was 75 yeah. percent crying right me the too. Rest typing and now when I'm writing I'm like if I'm not crying is it good yeah 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 if, yeah if I'm not like gutting myself then like does anyone want I know to- where do we like go from <laughs> yeah I mean like yeah I know I know I was just thinking about that because like the the UK publisher was like do you think that you could like write in a, like another an essay to like help promote the book yeah and I was like I don't even know like what to write like what do I write about yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like I was like I'm really into chess these days like <laughs> I'm not gonna be like unpacking like my like I was like I kind of just want to write like like fluff for a little bit because like yeah. I, yeah absolutely I feel that too and I will say when I read the audiobook I turned off all the lights because oh wow like be inside the story did you cry I mean during the reading of that I wasn't and then yeah. he, the director made me say back a line and was like say it like you're actually speaking to her and then oh I oh my god it and it just broke whatever I yeah. had, guard I had going in and then I just had to stand up and just like shake out my arms yeah. for a bit. but yeah 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 it's intense oh I'm glad you read yours I should listen to it to it too. I don't know if I did a great job I feel like I was just trying to like not fuck it up you're literally a vocal like um, I know and also I come from like a line of like voice actors so it feels like I should do a really good job but I feel like I read it too like slowly or something um I'm still like finding my reading voice you know I feel like ideally you would do the audiobook after you've done some readings and like found your voice a little bit more but um right. that's interesting it is what it is you know <laughs> like Michelle Obama and Jacqueline Woodson yeah I've also never listened to audiobooks so I just like have no idea yeah 
Yes. At the end, they were like, can you talk about your favorite audiobooks? And I'm like, I, I've literally never read, I've never listened to an audiobook in my entire life. <laughs> I will exit now. Um, can you talk about <laughs> what the cover design and how many versions you went through, how you landed on the final one? Yeah, um, Na Kim did the cover design. Um, I was really, it was, uh, let's see, I think there were only... I think there were like four or five. There was not as many. I was like, I don't want to, you know. Wow, that's it's a, a Is it a lot? Um, the first, there were there were two that were pitched like at a time. So it was like mm -hmm. the first two, I really didn't like. Um, the first one was like I sent a bunch of like old family photos over um, for inspo, and I think that it, it took a weird turn once I did that, um, and like. The first one was like me as a kid with an umbrella and there were like Korean foods falling. And it was kind of oh. like a little cloudy with a chance of meat noodles. <laughs> and I was kind of like, do they, do they know that like, there's some like really intense stuff that happens in this book? Like, I don't want it to like seem like a children's book, you know? And then there was one that I really liked. I was really torn between the last two. Um, and it was, it was this one. And then there was one that was actually, it was like white, and there were two scallions and chopsticks laid over them to like make an H. And for me, when I think about H Mart, I think like, I think way more about scallions than I do about noodles. And I was also really freaked wow. out because I was like, these kind of noodles like aren't super, like aren't like a big Korean staple, you know? Like they're not like naengmyeon noodles, which are like buckwheat noodles. Um, there, there are like so many noodles like that look kind of like this, but it's not what I really think of when I think of Korean food and I don't talk about them in, well, I guess like in kungguksu, like in the in the soybean noodle soup that I talk about, they are made from these types of noodles. But I was worried that like this doesn't look like a Korean noodle for a long time. That's and they smart. used to have like little scallions in them. And so I was like, I think we should, which is funny because actually the, the illustrator is also Korean. And she put like these scallion noodles, these like scallions on it. And I was like, I don't know. Like little green like, circles or something? Yeah, she, there used to be like little scallions in them. And I was like, I feel like that's like more of a Chinese thing. Like, I don't really feel like that's like a, a Korean noodle at all. So right. then we took the scallions off and I, 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 I'm really glad. This one felt more literary. Um, mm -hmm. and, and my agents really loved this one. And so I was like, trust, I trust Brittany. Uh, everyone liked this one. I asked a ton of people and everyone liked this one more. So I, I'm glad, I, I, I feel like it's, it's the right one. I really what about you? I'm curious about, cause yours is very like elegant and very simple. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Yeah, no, first, there's a lot of visual metaphors in the book, one that had sand. So the first cover was like mm. golden sand, but it almost seemed like a beach romance. I don't know. Like I was just yeah, like, yeah, middle yeah. Age. that is funny. Yeah. <laughs> then, you had the exact opposite problem where they were, the, they made mine <laughs> yeah. look like a children's <laughs> book and yours looks like an old lady, like recounting like her, like from her beachfront property. <laughs> really on my like, What's it called? Adrionic chair? Andronic chair? What are those <laughs> chairs called? Oh, Adirondack chairs. Adirondack. <laughs> I don't know where it's either. Adirondack. That's, a, uh, that's such a West Coast thing. Yeah. Anyway. But you I not knowing that is a West Coast thing. I oh, think. got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and. Because the Adirondacks are like in North New York, like Northern New York, yes. like upstate. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Totally. And in your book, you have this detail where your husband. You, you described him, you can tell he's not from the West Coast because of it, his indifference to fireflies. I was like, <laughs> so genius, Dude, these things, are not just like he's from the East Coast, you have this way of, of the details you choose are just so incredible. Um, okay, so I want to say, there's so many good questions and you see all of them too. Oh, this is interesting because I think I've heard you talk about this before. So was it difficult to adapt the New Yorker article? I think you talked about this. So talk about the, the beginning of writing your book, how, like how you decide to do it, when the Crying in H Mart came out, and then any hesitation you had about putting something this personal into the world. Yeah, I'm curious how you answer this question because for me, it's just, it was just necessary, yes. you know, like, and that's such a boring thing to say, but like, I didn't even, 
I didn't even think about it as something personal. It was just like, I needed to like purge like what had happened. And I, and I think that there was this like almost sick desire to just like, I need everyone to know like what happened to me. Like it felt mm-hmm. like, you know, no one could understand what I went through or like my, like the extent of my pain, unless I like, you know, put it out there. Um, and it wasn't enough to just say like, my mom died, they needed to to see exactly what I witnessed and, and what I went through. So it wasn't hard for me to put something like this out of the world. I will say I also like had some experience with this because, you know, as a musician, I think you're in this unique position where, you know, your work and your life is like naturally really intertwined in this way. Um, so I was kind of used to already talking about it and I, I was already like uh, comfortable doing that in some way. There were like some hesitations, of course, I felt like, you know, at, at, are you doing it this at, at your mother's expense? Because my mother was like quite private and I felt a little bit nervous about certain, more of just like the physical like horror of what happens when someone is dying if it was if I was like bringing shame to her in some ways but it was also just really ultimately important for me to share those things because I was so angry that I had never read something like this before and that nothing had ever like sort of warned me that this this was something that happened um yeah a lot of people think that I expanded the essay but that essay actually started as the first chapter of this book before it was published in the New Yorker I actually wrote another essay called Love Lost and Kimchi that was in Glamour that was just about Mangchi. It was about, you know, a lot of it was repurposed for the Mangchi chapter. And it was kind of just, it started as something cute. You know, it was like a cute story about how this YouTube woman like had really helped me during this very difficult time. It was like a Korea Julian Julia. And like, I just wanted to share that experience. And I think in writing that I realized like there is such a bigger story here that I want to tell. Um, But I had to kind of put it to the side for a while because my music career was really taking off. And it wasn't until like the winter of 2017 that I actually had time to like stay in Korea for six weeks and used it as this sort of retreat for me to like begin writing what that story might look like. And so I feel like I wrote, you know, pretty like an outline and like maybe the first like six or seven chapters. Um, And the first chapter was crying in H Mart. And then it wasn't until like this spring of 2018 or the summer of 2018 that um, we were connected with a New Yorker and I sent them the first chapter. Uh, And so I always kind of, it it wasn't an expansion of the essay. Actually, that essay was almost just like always going to be this sort of overture of like everything that the book was going to go into. That's super interesting. Yeah, I think I almost like, again, it's like you're you're hit by something in your life and the feeling is too big. Like yeah, it's yeah. like a dome of jello or something <laughs> in the middle. And you're like, I can't go anywhere until I like eat my way out of this thing. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends until I confront what just happened. Right, and right, right. So it's, it's like a choice, but it doesn't really feel like a choice. And I think, yeah, again, what you bore witness to needing to relay that, like it's almost like a secret you have that you yeah. look and no one has exposure to this thing they need to know. Um, so that's, oh, but the one thing I get that's like a compliment, but is actually like one of my least favorite. Yeah, yeah. People are like, um, they're like, wow, you're so vulnerable or like you're so <laughs> open. And then I, yeah. I'm like thank you but then I'm like what did I put in that they're like wow like she yeah 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 that. like it's like what you you're like what did I I don't even know but I know because you're in this sort of like haze of just like and then this <laughs> and then yeah. this yeah yeah. yeah 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 I'm like should I not be this way like yeah. but yeah. then do you feel that once you've shared it now there's nothing that's like oh no that was too far like I feel like there's there's so there's so little you could say that everything you say is going to align with someone out there. Yeah. I feel like what's like the reason why you, like, I feel like the, the, there are certain parts that there were certainly like I had pause because it was really far. But then I also kind of delighted in that because I was just like, well, that's like when it's really good. You know what I mean? Like, um, I don't know if like other people, I mean, I, I don't know if other people feel that way, but for me, that was, that's a sweet spot. <laughs> poking, poking that far, I think was, the, is the most exciting thing, you know? Um, I think that's like when you really feel like you're on something or like releasing something new into the world. 
Totally. Well, you totally have. Everything you've been like put through writing this book was worth it. I think the the questions are so potent. There's so many, but I just hope. I don't know if it's hit you yet what you've really accomplished and put into the world, um, but it's it's so astounding. And I just I've so enjoyed being able to speak with you and celebrate you and we'll continue to flail our ways into the future and try and write something good again. Oh, that sounds lovely. We should we should start a writing group now. That's right. It'll be very- two new New Yorkers. I know. Two new New Yorkers writing fluff. <laughs> <laughs> Half Asian <laughs> writing squad. Hello. Hi, yeah. Javier. Thank you so much. I mean, this was a lot of fun. And by the way, this book right here, buy it. Okay. <laughs> and uh and 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 buy all the music and buy it from Acapella books, and it's great. And y'all are just so much fun tonight. I, I can't spend it, stand it. Um it, I learned a lot. Um thank you so much. Which is a low bar, but I learned a lot. Now <laughs> I, I hope that everybody will also, after buying this book, will come back next week because we have our new Atlanta and Charles Blow um, from the New York Times is going to be um, here with his his new book. And uh, and please, um, it's called uh, The Devil You Know. And Virginia Prescott from Georgia Public Broadcasting will be his interviewer. Um, she will have a hard time following Chanel um, because there are a lot of things that happened tonight. Probably won't happen next week. So I really... <laughs> y'all being here and it was a lot of fun thank you and thank you everybody thank you thank you so much